and the, the number one thing you need to hear every time we get together is that if you die and leave this planet without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you end up in a place called hell. That's a fact. That's not a neat story. That's not a uh, let's play a video and try to scare some people into doing something that they don't want to do. That's the truth. <clears throat> and when you leave this planet, you must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's, what, that's why we're here. The number two thing, and the reason that we show you that video tonight is this. The topic for tonight, uh, we've been doing the deal called Sloganville, talking about different slogans and what we can learn from, from a slogan like Lowe's that said, let's build something together. We talked about that last week. Uh, talked about the first week when the little old lady in the, the Wendy's commercials years ago said, where's the beef? We talked about where the beef was in your relationship with Christ and how deep and, and strong your, your relationship with him was. And tonight, it goes back to the Verizon wireless commercials that, that, that they consider it. They say that it's the world's largest network. And I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but in our world today, you can, how many of you are on Twitter? Like one of you right now is beeping. You're like twittering something right now. All you know and you, you, what, what you figured out is that we can be in touch with everyone in the world pretty quickly if we need to. Y'all can come in and sit down if you want to. Got lots of chairs. Make yourself right at home. You want to? No? All right. But we've got into this world that we have, that, that have developed ourselves and says we can find anybody at any time we want to. We truly are at this point in history part of the world's largest network. And I don't know if you're a Verizon customer or an AT&T customer or whatever. That's not the point tonight. The point is that you, as a believer, now listen, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God has given you partial responsibility for the people in your network. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the reason he has those people in your network is for them to hear about Jesus through you. And what you heard in that video, and obviously like they said, it was a made-up letter and, and people don't receive letters from hell, so don't, you know, don't go into that later saying that you think they do. But it was, a, it was a, a, an illustration to show us what would happen if you had a friend that died and was able to write you a letter and ask you why you never told them about Jesus. But the question does come to mind tonight, how many people do you know that are in your network right now that need to hear about Jesus and you've chosen not to tell them? How many people are in your mind right now that you know needed to be here tonight but you didn't invite them? How many people could we think of when, when you talk about uh, things like the world's largest network and and you talk about last week, let's build something together. And we talked about building something together and people becoming children of God. How many of those people did you still decide this week, you know, it's just my workmate, you know, they're okay, they're going to find it on their own. They want Jesus, they'll be able to figure this thing out. And you walk away. <clears throat> and you have people in your network, people that you know every day, that you've chosen not to tell about Jesus. I don't know why we do that. I know some reasons. You know, some of you are scared to say, well, I don't know enough about Jesus myself, so if I say something, then I might, be, I might look stupid and, and all this kind of stuff. I've come to learn that the real reason we don't tell other people about Jesus or invite them to Excel or invite them to some other church setting in some way is that we care more about how we look than how they look. And we care more about our feelings than their feelings. Because the truth is, if that letter was actually possible, and if it could happen, when somebody dies and ends up in hell, after God gave us the opportunity to share Christ with them, I want you to see a biblical example of it. Because I know you think it's just a video and, and nothing like that can ever happen. And, and here's the, 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 the testimony from Scripture. It says this in Luke chapter 16, verse 22 is where we'll start. It says, finally, the poor man died. The story we have is that a guy named Lazarus was a poor man, and he was living outside the gate of a rich guy. 
And the rich guy didn't like the poor guy because he was always begging for everything. And this is where we end up at this point. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And his soul went to the place of the dead. So you got a poor man who was carried to heaven and you got a rich man who ended up in hell. There in torment, the rich man, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. Now you can imagine at this point what the rich man is thinking about Lazarus. Because he knows where he's sitting and he's looking up at, into the heavens at Abraham, looking at Lazarus thinking, oh man, that's that poor guy that I kicked yesterday. You know what I'm talking about? That's that guy that, man, I knew I should have done something different with him, but I didn't. That's the guy. That's where he sits right now and he says, Verse 24, the rich man shouted, Father, Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in, 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 I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, but Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here be, being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. I want you to understand something from that scripture passage. Number one thing you understand that there is a place called hell. Okay, we just need to get that through our skulls tonight. In case you're one of those people that lives that, that, that beautiful life that we have a God that loves people too much, he would never send anybody to hell, really. That's not the case. And, and, and if you really want to get into the, the, all the talking of it, God doesn't send people to hell. People send each other. People send themselves to hell. People that decide not to accept the gift that God gave us. But you also need to understand this is the key to it all. And what you see in this situation is this. When it is over, it's over. Okay, there is nobody going to come, come send you a letter from hell that says, hey, can you just bring me a drink of water because it's really hot down here. He makes it very clear to us that there is no crossing over between there, here and there. And I say that, and, and, and this is, like I said, this is a different kind of message for XL tonight. But I say that because of this. There are people in Rome, Georgia that need to know Jesus. And the only way they're ever going to meet him is when you tell them about him. There are people all over Floyd County that need Jesus and need a relationship with him. But they're not going to know him. They're not going to know Christ until you tell them. And there's so many of us that spend so much time worrying about, man, I don't know if I should really invite them because, man, you know, I, I may look stupid or they may, they may make fun of me or they may tell me I don't know what I'm talking about or they may reject me. And what we say is, God, I know you want to reach all these people and I know you want to have relationships with all these people, but I don't really want to put my tail on the line and sacrifice anything of mine to tell them about you. And what we begin to look at is we begin to look at a guy like the rich guy here. <clears throat> and a guy like Lazarus. And you notice the rich guy comes back and he says, Okay, if you can't help me, then at least go tell my brothers. Send somebody to tell them what, what bad things are going to happen to them if they don't know Jesus. And I'm wondering tonight if that's us. I'm wondering tonight if we as Christians, if we as believers are willing to say, I'll be the one to go and tell whoever needs to be told. I'll be the one to make sure I go and tell whoever needs to be told that Jesus Christ loves them and has a great plan for their lives. I'll be the one that goes and tells anybody that will listen to me that it's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Tonight, you may be sitting here tonight and you're like, okay, he's kind of talking to the other people because I don't know Jesus yet. Listen. You need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the best thing in the world that ever happened to you is that one of these people in here probably invited you to be here. 
And they were willing to step out of their comfort zone and say to you, listen, buddy, you need to come here and hear this message because Jesus will change your life. And that's why you're here tonight. And for the rest of us, we have to begin looking at the questions and trying to figure out what it means when we say, okay, this story is about a guy that died and went to hell and then tried to talk to the people outside of it. The letter that we just heard, the, the letter from hell that we just saw, saw the video of, was a guy that was in hell that was ticked off because his friend that was a Christian didn't tell him. But we still sit here and we know the reasons why we don't tell people about Jesus. We know that we either have a fear, we have some kind of thought that we just are not going to have the right answers. Some of us really have an idea that God's really not going to help anybody anyway, so why should we push that on them? We really believe in that thing of, well, you know, people should just decide for themselves. They don't want me pushing my religion on them. And the challenge I have for that is this very clearly. When someone ends up in hell, the last thing in the world they're going to be worried about is whether or not you pushed your religion on them. And at the same exact time, when someone begins a relationship with Jesus Christ, and God moves in their life, and changes them for all eternity, the last thing in the world they're going to be offended by is you pushing your Jesus on them. But ultimately, I think it comes down to this. We don't want to be bothered. And I want you to see one more video clip before we close this thing out. But I think there's something about us that says, you know what, I'm just not going to go there just yet. I'm not going to worry about that. Play that next clip. bother me with souls to save. I have my own agenda. There's school to do, sports to play, important stuff to attend to. Don't bother me with my friend at work. He's got his own religion. I don't have time to change his mind. He'll make his own decision. Don't bother me with that little girl, the girl playing in the street. She's much too young to understand that the Savior she can meet. Don't bother me with the sounds I hear, the sounds of people shrieking. Although I wonder who they are, who are these victims screaming? Don't bother me with who they are. I really don't want the blame. Because it's my friend at work and that little girl who from hell scream out my name. of you ever get to that point, some of you have children, and you get to that point sometimes during the day where all you want your children to do is stop bothering you. Anyone? Anybody got a testimony? Right here, back in the back, hey! And you get to that point, and then we get to this point, because some of you have, have taken time this summer to get on vacation, and you've gone down to the beach and hung out, and your number one goal is to not be bothered for that week. Whether it is you throw your cell phone in the trash before you go out or you do whatever and you go out and you sit in your big chair and you're looking at the beach and you're like, okay, please world, just shut up and don't bother me. That's your goal for that week. You know, I'm into that and I'm all about that every once in a while, just needing to, to spend some time. My wife, for Father's Day, got me the ultimate gift I've been asking for for many, many moons. Right, babe? And I now have a huge double-sided hammock on my back porch. When I lay in that hammock and my children begin to run out and go, Hey, Daddy, Daddy! My thought is, Oh, just don't bother me for a minute. This is my time. But you know what? We do that spiritually as well. And we try our best to live our lives for Jesus and say that we're living our lives for Jesus. And then when Jesus approaches us and says, Hey, the guy you work with needs to hear about me. Oh, don't bother me. And when the Holy Spirit begins to move in our lives and in our minds and he says, hey, the girl at work that you talk to every day needs to be invited to church, needs to be invited to exhale, needs to be told about me, and we say, oh, Spirit, don't bother me. And what we do is we become a people that lives our lives trying not to be bothered for the sake of Christ. Because it's a bother, isn't it? I mean, to step out of your comfort zone and say, hey, uh, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Hey, do you go to church anywhere? Hey, I got this thing we do on Sunday night. This freak talks for a little while. We got some crazy music. 
6 o'clock if you want to come. And then they say, sure, man, but I don't have a car. Pick me up. And then we're like, oh, man. Now you're bothering me. And I wonder just how far we're willing to go to say, you know what? I'll do anything and everything it takes to get people to Jesus. How far are you willing to go to say, I never want to have one of my friends end up in a place called hell. I never want to end up with one of my friends in a place that I don't want to go myself. I never want to have a family member leave this earth without a relationship with Jesus Christ. How far are you willing to go? Believers, if you know Christ and you have a relationship with him, how far are you willing to go to make sure nobody you know goes to hell? There's a church that I listen to a a lot of their stuff all the time, and they talk about that they want to make their city the hardest place in the world to go to hell from. They want to reach so many people that it's hard to die in that city and not know Jesus. And I wonder how our hearts are in lining up with that. Like I said, I've said it ten times tonight. You may not even know Jesus yet, and you're sitting here kind of wondering what this is all about. This is about you. Because our goal is to help you meet Jesus. Period. What you've walked in on tonight, and a lot of you are here tonight brand new, but what you've walked in on is a little bit of family time. For us to say to each other, there are a lot of people in this world that don't know Jesus. It's time to go get them. It's time to go find them. So my prayer for you tonight is going to be very simple, and it is this, that you will decide in your life that nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important to you and your friends and your family members than telling them about a relationship with Jesus Christ. If we do that, and if we decide that, and if we change our philosophy to that, then we'll see people come to know Jesus and grow in his kingdom that never had a chance before because we're doing what we're called to do. I'm going to pray for us. Then the band's going to come play a few songs, and they're going to, um, I'll close this out way at the end of that tonight. But here's the deal. Right after I pray, man, here's, here's the real situation. If you want to talk to me about any of this, if you want to talk to somebody about Jesus, we'll be back there. Even as they play, we'll be back there. Why? Because that's the most important thing we do. But as I pray, you commit before your God tonight to be the person that finds people and tells them about Jesus no matter what it takes. Be committed to that. And we'll see what happens. And we'll see God do some amazing things pray for y'all. Father, we pray tonight that you are going to be the king and the Lord of our lives, and we pray that we will live for you according to your plan. God, and we pray that we will truly, truly have a desire to see people come to know you. God, that it won't be about us sitting around enjoying our own blessings and the, the great things you've given us and watching other people die and, and go to hell and spend eternity without you, God but it will be about us finding people and helping them connect to the God that's got a great plan for their lives. Father, we give this night to you, and I pray specifically for anyone in this room that needs you, God, that they would meet you tonight face to face. Lord, I pray for every other person in this room that has a relationship with you, God. I pray you challenge us this week and the next week. God, you get us serious about the business of telling people about you. And we trust you with all the results of that, God. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.